to me to First Samuel, I was, we were singing that last song, and I was almost, almost grinning and laughing on stage. Uh, we have uh, two young men up here that uh, we trust to play the most obnoxious instruments, and I thought how incredible that was, uh, that we have these two young people that we trust to lead, help lead our body in worship, and uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Uh, so Tyler, Bryce, good job. And so thanks for not blowing our eardrums out. Uh, today, uh, turn with me to 1 Samuel 27 and 28. 27 and 28. As we, as we walk through these uh, two chapters... Uh, they, uh, they, they deal with a pretty weighty subject, and that is uh, the sin of these two, uh, these two men, these two, two guys, one that is, uh, that is the king of God's chosen people, and the other who is anointed to be king, but not king yet. And as we talk about uh, their sin, we, uh, we want to do so in a way where we uh, acknowledge the sin that is in our life also, uh, that we wouldn't uh, look at the life of David or the life of Saul and point the fingers uh, towards them and say, yeah, look at how uh, crazy they are or look at the dumb things they do. But the hope would be is that we would look at their lives and then we would look back upon our own lives and see uh, the sin and the consequences of sin with within our own uh, lives and our own behavior. As I think about sin, I think of the weight of the sin. I've asked Bryce to come up and help me real quick. Uh, and, uh, and I brought these weights up on stage, talking about the weight of sin, bringing some weights up. I, I thought, who's a, who's a big, strong kid, a uh, young man that can hold some of these? And, and Bryce, uh, I got a couple of weights for you. Uh, do you want to hold them in, in one hand or two? Two hands? Uh, so two hands like this, or two hands like this. All right, I'm gonna be nice to them. So these are uh, these are five pound weights. There's two of them. Uh, can you put them out a little further? Perfect. So turn with me to First Samuel 27, and uh, a little further. Thank you. Uh, and, and are those weights too bad? Not too bad, right? All right. I'm going to step it up a little bit. So Bryce has just a little bit of sin in his life, and then uh, we'll add just a tiny bit more. That's another five pounds uh, of sin in Bryce's life. How, how's that? A little harder. A little harder, but still, you're pretty tough. Pretty, he's starting to shake. It's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, sin, sin in our life becomes a burden right? As we look at our life and as we look at choices in our lives, if, as we choose sin, the sin in our lives weigh us down. Uh, you might need another one. What do you think? Can we put this one on the bottom? Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, that was a 10-pound one. So now Bryce is holding uh, 10 and then another 10. He's holding 25 pounds of burden. Uh, and and as, we, as we sin and as we choose, what's wrong? I thought you were strong. <laughs> uh, as we choose to sin, just hold them right there. That's good. As we choose to sin in our lives, it, it burdens and it weighs our life down. And if we're a child of God if we have chosen to follow him and we continue, as we continue to sin, it brings us off track and weighs us down from being able to accomplish the purpose and goals that God would place in front of us for him. It's, it makes it hard for us uh, to, to live on mission for him. Now, if we have not given our lives to Christ, if we uh, have not become a follower of Christ, uh, our sin makes that impossible. It separates us from God. It separates us from his love, uh, and we are still living under his wrath. But this weight of sin 
this burden of sin that holds us down. Today, I'm going to take these weights from Bryce. Uh, I'm not going to hold these while I preach. Uh, but Bryce, thank you for holding them for us. You can go sit back down. Uh, today, as we look at the burden of sin in David and Saul's life, uh, we're going to see David, and we're going to see this man uh, who sins, who's not perfect, uh, who we know later on is going to be called a man after God's own heart. Uh, we're going to see this man uh, who, in the end, we would say he's trying. He's trying to honor God uh, in, in, in the ways that he uh, knows best. He's trying to honor God, and he's, he falls short. We probably, probably a lot of us can resonate with David. I try. I want to I I serve him well. I want to be obedient to his word, uh, and I fall short. And I repent, and I keep moving forward trying to honor God the best I can. And then we see Saul. Saul, this man uh, who has, at this point in his life, has demonstrated uh, that he does not truly have a heart to honor God. We've seen him uh, over and over again act in a selfish way. Uh, we've seen over and over again he has done things uh, out of uh, his own fear and his own not trusting God. We've seen him act in um, a murderous and angry way uh, to God's people uh, to the point of killing, uh, like, if I remember right, it was 80 priests. Uh, we see him over and over and over again act in a way that is dishonoring to God. And we see over and over again, we, we have never truly seen Saul repent of his sin and turn away. He's always just continued to walk in the weight of that sin. We've seen both of these men's hearts and we see this heart of David who has this heart to want to honor God. And we see this heart of Saul who wants to honor himself, that wants to promote himself and truly doesn't seem like he desires to honor God. We'll start with looking at David's sin in chapter 27. Uh, David uh, is on the run. Uh, he's on the run from Saul. Uh, and, and, and like we talked about last week, he's uh, probably been on the run now for maybe close to 10 years. 10 to 15 years David's going to be on the run for. And uh, so David now has been on the run a long time. Uh, and, and it starts out by saying in verse 1, that one day David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hands of Saul. The best thing I can do is escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hands. So as David has been on the run, uh, he's had a opportun couple opportunities uh, to take Saul's life in his own hands and has chosen not to. A and David, now we don't know how much time has passed since the last time David has, uh, David has interacted with Saul, but it's been some time and David now, it says that he thinks to himself, David, uh, in his, probably in his heart, in his mind, uh, he starts to have these thoughts. If if I don't run away, if I don't get away to the land of the Philistines, Saul is going to kill me. Ultimately, David here is doubting God's word and promises to him. We know that David uh, has been anointed to be king, has been promised to be king. Uh, he's not yet king, so we know that it's not his time to die. Uh, so, so David ultimately is not trusting God in this. And he's saying, if, if I don't do something, then I'm going to die. And he's ultimately not trusting God in this moment. So David and his 600 men, uh, it says uh, that David took his 600 men and their family. So this might be 1,200 people. Uh, this might be a couple thousand people. Uh, I think wives and children. Uh, but if maybe at the most, two or 3,000 go to King Achish. And they go to Achish. He is uh, a ruler amongst the Philistines. 
And, uh, and so David and his wives and uh, then his men and their wives and children go to Achish. Uh, so they leave the land that God has promised them. They leave uh, the protection of being within uh, Israel land and they go to the land of the Philistines. So David runs uh, to Philistine territory to find his protection takes his men with him, goes to King Achish. He says, if I found favor in your eyes, please let me stay here. Uh, let me be assigned to one of your small towns. Uh, but, but, but I want to be outside of the city. And so Achish gives him uh, the land of Ziglag. And this is found in verse 6. And, and it says that this land uh, still belongs to the kings of Judah uh, to this point of, of writing here. Uh, so uh, so Achish gives David this, this city uh, for him and his men to live in, uh, and uh, David lives there for about 16 months uh, away from God's people. Now when, uh, when we remember back to, to last week, David was talking about being weary, was talking about being uh, worried that he uh, would, would leave the land uh, and maybe even fall into, uh, by leaving the land, would fall into the, I, the worship of idols. Now he's living in the land of the Philistines with his men. And we don't have any indication that he falls into those temptations. Uh, but he is outside of God's territory. And I would say that he's probably outside God's plan for his life. In verse 8, uh, David uh, would take his men... Uh, he would gather his men and he would go uh, to the outskirts uh, of different Israelite territory and he would raid the land. Uh, so when he, what he would do is he would take his men, uh, he would go to areas that uh, were uh, enemies of the Israelites uh, that were living close to those areas, like close to the land of Judah, and he would, he would raid the land and then uh, get supplies for his city. And it says here uh, that he would, he would wipe out the people of the land. Now, this is pretty, this is pretty heavy, uh, that he wouldn't leave. It says that he doesn't leave any man or woman alive. Uh, he took all the cattle, the sheep, the donkey, the camels, and the clothes, and then would return back to Achish. Here, uh, it's believed that David, as he's raiding uh, these outskirt lands, that David uh, is actually uh, taking out and, uh, and wiping out the people that the Israelites were supposed to have wiped out when they entered the land. Uh, when they entered the promised land, they were told to, to wipe out uh, the people groups there, uh, and they didn't. And, and by not doing that, it allowed idol worship uh, to come into the land. It allowed uh, intermarriage uh, that would allow that idol worship to come into the land. And, and it was outside of God's plan. And so what's believed is David is, is going around and wiping out those people. And uh, now we don't know how successful he was, but we know by doing so, he would go back to King Achish and he would report uh, of what he had done. And he was, he, was, he was very wise in how he reported back. He, he would report back that he was, uh, it says, in the Negev of Judah or the Negev of a certain country. And, and, and what that means is that he was in the desert area or the outlying area of that land. Now, King Achish, when he heard that, he believed that, that David was going into his own people, into David's own people, and raiding their land, uh, and was making enemies for himself of his own people. So Achish would have been pretty excited about that. Uh, Achish would have been happy about that. That wasn't what David was doing. Uh, but, but Achish thought that, uh, and it says here in verse 12, Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for life. David here, uh, he, leaves his, he leaves his people. He leaves uh, God's chosen people. He runs to the enemy 
uh, and I believe it's because he doesn't truly trust God. He runs to the enemy. He makes himself a servant of an enemy king. And, and then in the last little bit here, of uh, it's the beginning of verse, uh, chapter 28, we're going to see that David even pledges himself to be the bodyguard or maybe an armor bearer to a foreign king. David's sin has some consequences here. Uh, David's uh, not trusting God uh, has some consequences here, not only for him, but for his people. You're telling me out of his 600 men and their wives and children, none of them fell into idol worship. None of them were tempted uh, to live a life outside of God's plan for, for their life. And David led his men to that. David's sin here, we see that he leaves God's land. He brings his men and family with him. He seeks the favor of the ungodly in Achish, and he agrees to be his own enemy's bodyguard. David here, uh, I believe David here has, has sinned. He's acted outside of God's plan for his life. What's interesting here as we, we say that David sinned uh, is, is David, if you look at Psalms 11, which we'll look at later, David uh, writes that Psalms of, at about the same time uh, that he's in this land, and we see that David uh, acts with a repentant heart. Uh, we see where David uh, realizes the wrong that he's done, and he realizes who God is in his life. And I believe that David, uh, we're going to see that David acts much differently in his sin when Saul does. In chapter 28 now, uh, Saul, uh, Saul is the king. Uh, Saul is, is becoming an older man, an old man, uh, and uh, he, is still, he is still after David. Uh, he's still after uh, trying to take David out, and we see where, uh, where, where this has been interrupted a little bit by a battle with the Philistines. Uh, so Saul's been, uh, been after David, and then he's left and gone home, and now we see him in battle with the Philistines. And Saul, we're going to look at his sin, but before we do, uh, this, is, this is a pretty difficult passage. Uh, it's a difficult passage because of some of the stuff that's happening here. We're going to see where Saul is going to go uh, to a medium or to a witch. Uh, and and, and I, I believe that we would not do this passage justice if we didn't talk a little bit about what Saul's doing here. Saul is, is dealing with the occult, the witches, or the demonic. And, uh, and, and I believe that us in our culture today, even though uh, we, would, we would immediately say as Christians we should have nothing to do with that, I think there's many times where we, in our culture, we get close to dealing with the occult and witches and the demonic. And I want to say that for us, as God's people, as Christians, we should have nothing to do with the demonic. Nothing to do with the occult or witches. Just the other day on the radio, I was driving home. It was late at night, uh, and I listened to local radio. I don't even know the name of the station, uh, but it was a local radio station, and they had a full, uh, like, two-hour program on Ouija boards. This is in our culture. This is on our local radio station, uh, and it's talking about how harmless uh, Ouija boards are. Uh, how, how they're no big deal and they're fun to play with. And I want to say uh, for, for us as Christians, we need to have nothing to do with that realm. We know that that realm is real. It's not a game. It's not something that we play with. It's not a child's board game. Uh, it, is, it is real. We know that uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness in this evil world. Those powers are real. And we're going to see Saul here uh, come to a witch. And I want to remind us that Leviticus chapter 19, and it's this verse 31, it says, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritualists, for you will be defied by them. 
I am the Lord your God. So when Leviticus, God commands his people, uh, don't, don't dabble in these things. Don't be around uh, these things. And then for us in the New Testament, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness. So often we use that verse uh, to say that, that we should be really careful with who we're friends with or who we, uh, who we are acquaintances with, that we should be equally yoked together with believers. But when you really look at that, it's saying, what, what does a righteous person have to do with this wickedness? Uh, stay away from the darkness. It says, what fellowship does light and darkness have together? So for us, as we, as we look at this second part of Saul and Saul's uh, sin and his lifestyle of sin, I think it's just a really good reminder for us that children of God should have nothing to do with the darkness of this world. We should stay far, far from it. As we look at now uh, chapter 28, Saul in verse 3, it says, Now Samuel was dead. And the Israelites mourned for him. We know that Samuel died uh, two or three chapters ago. And it says that, uh, that they buried him at Ramah and that Saul had expelled all the media, mediums and spirits from the land. So at one point, Saul understood that, that, that light and darkness or that God's people should have nothing to do with this spirit world, that it's demonic. And so Saul has expelled uh, these people from the land. Uh, but in verse 4, the Philistines have assembled. They've come and set up camp. Uh, they've gathered together. And when Saul saw the Philistine army, it says in verse 5, that he became afraid. It says that terror filled his heart. So Saul at one point understood the wickedness of the demonic, expelled him from the land. Now we see Saul, uh, as, as the Philistine army starts to gather, we see Saul become fearful. Uh, we see Saul uh, start to have terror in his life. Uh, he's unsure of what's going to happen. Uh, and, and we know that Saul has not been living in a way that was honoring to God. He has lived apart from honoring God time after time after time. And Saul, the first point of Saul here is Saul's sin and his lifestyle of sin brings some desperation. Saul, as he sees this army gather, he doesn't immediately turn uh, to God. Uh, it says here, uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 5, uh, he says, uh, He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams, by the Urim, or by the prophets. So Saul uh, maybe, maybe reached out to God in some way, uh, but, it, but, he, but he was looking for answers from God uh, within the miraculous. Uh, he said, God, well, God didn't answer me in a dream. Well, Saul, you haven't been living your life for him in a way that honored him, what makes you think he's going to answer you in a dream? Uh, then he, he doesn't answer in the Urim or Thummim, uh, which was what the priests would carry in their cloaks, and they could get an answer uh, that, that, that was on maybe a tablet, a white tablet, or a, a, a dark tablet that was a yes or no. Uh, and he doesn't answer within the prophets, well, Saul, you, you've killed, or sorry, or, or in the priests, well, Saul, you killed all the priests. And uh, you took all the priests out. You wiped them out of the land. And uh, the only priest left uh, that we know of is with David uh, and walking with David. So, Saul, why would you think that God would answer you with the priests? You've killed all of them. And then he doesn't answer within the prophets. Uh, well, the last prophet is, uh, is dead. Samuel uh, has, uh, is, is not there anymore. And Saul, uh, as he doesn't get answers as he lives uh, outside of God's plan, he starts to become more and more desperate. And this lifestyle uh, of desperation is going to bring him to a dark place. So Saul, in verse 7, it says that he sent his attendants to find a woman who was a medium so he could inquire of her. 
There was one in Endor, they said. So Saul, uh, he doesn't hear from God. Uh, He hasn't been seeking God anyways. Uh, And he becomes more and more desperate. He's becoming more and more scared and filled with terror. Uh, And so Saul, in his desperation, reaches out to something that he knows because he's casted them out already once. To something that he knows is far outside of God's plan. When I think about Saul's desperation, I think about the consequences of sin in our own life. As we live in a lifestyle or pattern of sin, uh, that sin uh, becomes a weight and it stacks up more and more. As Bryce was sitting there holding those weights, uh, as he held about five pounds, it wasn't very hard and he could hold it for a long time. Uh, And then as those weights stacked up more and more, as, as the weight of his sin, he became more and more desperate to try to drop those weights or to pull his hands back in and get rid of them. This lifestyle of sin brings desperation and it causes us to do things sometimes uh, that would be so far outside of God's plan or thoughts or thoughts that we would even have for our own lives. This lifestyle sin of Saul's brought desperation and I believe that a lifestyle of sin for us brings us to a desperate place. In verses 9, uh, nine and 10, so Saul has, uh, has inquired or he's found out that there's this witch in Endor. Uh, and Saul disguises himself in verse 8. Uh, and he puts on some different clothes and he goes out at night. Uh, this very much indicates this, what Saul was doing. He knew what he was doing was wrong. Uh, If Saul uh, was not worried about what he was doing, being sinful or being wrong, he would have gone out in the daylight. Uh, He wouldn't disguise himself, and he would have gone straight uh, to this uh, witch, this witch of Endor. But he knows what he's doing is wrong. And so he goes to her at night, and he consults, uh, he asks her to consult a spirit for himself uh, and bring someone to me that I name. And in verse 9, we see uh, that the woman said, Surely you know that Saul uh, has cast us out. So, so here we see where uh, this woman's like, Look, I'm not supposed to do those things. Uh, I'm not, Saul has kicked me out of the land. Uh, she hasn't recognized Saul yet. I'm not supposed to do those things. Uh, and, and so she's ha- having this conversation with Saul. And, and she's like, But if I do this, it will bring death. It could be a trap to my life. And Saul speaks up in verse 10. He says, uh, he says to the woman in verse 10, Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lived you, or lives, you will not be punished for this. The second point of Saul's lifestyle of sin is it causes him to do the unthinkable. Saul here just swears by the name of the Lord, to a demonic power. Uh, So he uses the name of the Lord to bring up the demonic. I mean, it just, like, as I look at that and as I read that this week, it's like, it's like unthinkable uh, that you would even, even, it even go there. He's asking for demonic powers to help him in the name of God. Our sin sometimes causes us to do the unthinkable, that our sin causes us uh, to do things that we would never think we would do. That that thought of I would never or they, he or she would never, we would never think of calling up a demonic spirit in the name of the Lord, but that's exactly what Saul does here. Uh, And so in verse 11, the woman says, well, who should I bring for you? And Saul asks for Samuel, uh, would you bring up Samuel? And, and when she saw, that's uh, in verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said, Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. So at this moment, uh, as Saul has asked uh, to bring up this spirit of Samuel, Uh, she realizes who Saul is. Now we need to stop here for just a quick second because uh, it's an important note. 
We see that this lady, this witch, has brought up some type of evil spirit or manifestation of Samuel. Now, and scholars debate what's actually happening here. And I think it's important for us to, to note this. Uh, scholars debate, and the debate looks like this. Either it is actually the spirit of Samuel that is being brought up, or it is this witch uh, conjuring up something like she's done in the past uh, that's, that's maybe demonic, uh, maybe has a, a, a demon attached to it, uh, but she, she lives in that world and she works in that world, so that wouldn't be that far off. Uh, so the debate is, is this Samuel spirit or is this a, what would be called a familiar spirit? Is this the f- spirit uh, of a demonic being impersonating Samuel? And I, and I want you to know that scholars debate that. People uh, are on both sides of that. Uh, my opinion on this is that it's Samuel. Is that, uh, is that it's a one-off in the Bible. We don't see this ever again, but that our all-powerful God allows Samuel to come to Saul at that moment. That's my, that's my belief. And I come to that by, by this here. It says, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice, Saul, you have deceived me, for you are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid of what you see. The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming out of the earth. So, so, so here we see this woman as she's uh, conjured up the spirit. Maybe she's done this in the past. Uh, we see her cry out in a loud voice. Uh, it's probably different than what she's done in the past. She all of a sudden sees something that she's not as familiar with. This lady uh, would have made money, would have been a professional at consulting with the demonic. But all of a sudden, Samuel, I believe, has come up and she sees something different. She sees something that she's not as familiar with. And then we see this conversation that, uh, that Samuel is going to have with Saul. And, uh, and so that's why I come to the conclusion that, that God has allowed this to happen. And we know that, that we serve an all-powerful God. In verse 15 now, it says here that Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul says, I am in great distress. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, neither by prophets nor by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. So here we see this interaction between Samuel and Saul. Another reason why I believe that uh, this was... This was actually Saul and God allowing Samuel, sorry, God allowing Samuel to come to Saul. He says, uh, Samuel says, or Saul says to Samuel, I'm of great distress. God's not answering me. The Philistines are fighting. Uh, so I had nothing else to do but to call on you. Samuel's answer in verse 16 says, why do you consult me? Now the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy. The Lord has done, done what he What he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given them to your neighbor David because you do not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver you or deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines tomorrow. You and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. So then Samuel has this interaction with Saul. Uh, and Samuel says to Saul, uh, Saul, why are you, why are you doing this? Uh, and, 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 and you're doing this because God has departed from you and become your enemy. So Saul, time after time after time, has chosen to live in a way that was outside God's plan for his life, and God removed his spirit from Saul. 
And, and then Samuel goes on to tell Saul uh, the consequences of his sin here. He's like, remember, the kingdom's going to be torn away from you. Remember, the kingdom's taken away. Saul knows this. Uh, Saul knows that the kingdom's going to go to David at this point. Uh, but, but then there's further consequences for Saul's sin here. Not only will the kingdom be taken away from you, uh, but it says, but, but tomorrow... The Philistines will deliver you and your sons into my hands. Uh, so, so, so Samuel says here, look, tomorrow uh, in battle, you and your sons are both going to die. So we see that Saul's sin uh, has some greater consequences. Uh, we see where Saul's sin not only is affecting him, but now it's affecting him, his sons. Uh, so we know that, that Jonathan uh, is going to die. And we're going to see that here in a couple weeks. Uh, but Saul's sons are going to die because of Saul's sin. And not only will it affect Saul uh, and his sons, uh, but it's going to affect the children of Israel. It says that the Philistines are going to, are, are going to, you're going to be taken out by the Philistines. They're going to be delivered into the hands of the Philistines. So the Israelite army is going to lose also. Saul's sin. Saul's sin brings deadly consequences, not only for himself, not only for his family, uh, but for the people that he should be ruling over and protecting. As we see Saul's lifestyle of sin, as we see Saul live in this lifestyle of sin, uh, we see where his sin brings desperation, where he, his sin then also causes him to do the unthinkable uh, we see where his sin then brings deadly consequences, not only on his, himself and his family, but on his people that he rules over. As we uh, look further uh, in this passage in verse 20, it says that Saul immediately fell to the ground uh, and, and as he heard Samuel's words, it says that his strength is gone. Saul's just heard that he's going to die, his kids are going to die, and that his people are going to face great military loss. And Saul uh, then falls down. And it says that his strength was gone because uh, he hadn't eaten anything all night. Then further on in verses uh, 21 through 24, we'll see where this, uh, this lady, this witch, goes on uh, to care for Samuel. Uh, she, she sees where he is famished, where he uh, is, uh, has no strength, uh, and then she goes on to prepare food for him. Uh, she goes on uh, to slaughter the fattened calf for him, uh, and then to bake bread for him and take care of him. Uh, and uh, she, she set this table before Saul and his men, and they ate and then they got up and left later on. So we see where this lady uh, cares for Saul. But as we look at this passage, uh, both chapter 27 and 28, we see these consequences of sin. Uh, we see the consequences of sin in David's life. And we see the consequences of a lifestyle of sin in Saul's life. The difference, as I said, is, is the way that these two men handled themselves before God. As David would sin, as David uh, chose wrong outside of God's plan, we see David and this, re this heart to return back to God. As we, as we look and as we study Saul, we don't see that. We don't see this heart and this returning back to God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms chapter 11. David uh, would have written this psalm, it's believed, uh, at about the same time he was uh, fleeing, maybe, maybe in that time of that 16 months of being out of Israel and living in the land of the Philistines. And I want us to, to really hear David's heart here as he, as he writes this. Psalms 11, verse 1, it says, In the Lord I take refuge. How then can he say to me, Flee like a bird to the mountains? For look, the wicked bend their bows and they set their arrows against the string to shoot from the shadows at the upright heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. 
The Lord is in his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. He, his eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, on the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur and scorching winds will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice and the upright will see his face. Here we, we see a little bit of David's heart. Uh, we see a little bit of his, of his uh, acknowledgement of who God is. He is the righteous God. He is the righteous God who's in control of all things. And it says, in him I take refuge. That we don't see that in the life of Saul. We don't see where Saul took refuge in God. He uses God for his own purposes to accomplish his own, uh, his, like to promote him, himself. David take ref, takes refuge in his God. He understands uh, where God is, that God is holy and is in his holy temple on his throne. We don't see that with Saul. We see where Saul uses God's name to, to bring wickedness. Uh, he uses God's name to, punt, to promise that wickedness wouldn't come to somebody doing demonic action. We don't see where, where Saul has the same relationship that David has with God. At the end, David recognizes, he says, For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, and the upright will see his face. And I truly believe that David, being a man after God's own heart and desiring uh, to live as a man uh, that honors God, he, he, uh, he lives this way. He lives in a way knowing that the upright will see the face of God, and he desires to see his face. For us, for us here, uh, what is our application uh, of looking at the life of sin in David and the life of sin in Saul? For, for the person who is, um, who is not committed to following Jesus, uh, the answer to our sin is only found in the person of Christ. The answer to the weight of these sins is only found in the free gift of salvation found in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Repent and then turn to God so that your sins will be wiped out, so that the sins will be removed and we no longer carry the weight of these sins. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to keep his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So as we look at the weight of sin uh, and the consequences of sin in the life of David and in the life of Saul, if you haven't given your life to Jesus and you're carrying around these weights, I, I challenge you to make today the day where you repent of your sin. That you say, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to follow God and receive the free gift of salvation. And, and what's awesome, when we do that, we know that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And we know then in Luke chapter 15, verse 10, it says uh, that the angels rejoice uh, because, uh, because of one person turning to Christ. Uh, just as uh, we would rejoice along with you, we know that the angels rejoice. I challenge you today, if you're not a follower of Christ, make today the day that you follow him. And to those that are followers of Christ, uh, to those that have given their life to Jesus, uh, maybe we find ourselves uh, slowly picking up the weights of our sin, uh, the weight of the sin around us. Uh, maybe uh, we find ourselves holding this weight of sin, and I challenge you that today uh, to, to repent of that sin. Uh, to, to know and understand that having the weight of that sin not only hinders your relationship with God, but it hinders your relationship that you have with each other. It hinders your fellowship. We know that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to continue to hold the weight of this sin 
on and on and on. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which whom you have been sealed with to the day of redemption. You're like, hey, no, what does that have to do uh, with carrying my sin? As we carry our sin, it separates us from God. And, 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 and as we carry our sin, as we live in unrepented sin, as a child of God, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, we no longer can hear from the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us. We also know that the Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus if we're carrying around this weight of our sin, uh, we call ourselves a Christian, our lives aren't glorifying him anymore. And we're grieving his Holy Spirit. I challenge you, if you're a follower of Christ, to let down these sins, let down the sin today and do it his way. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word as we think about sin and the weight of our sin uh, Lord, it's, uh, it's not an easy to, topic to talk about. Father, it's, uh, we, we are humbled to talk about it because we know of the forgiveness that we have in your Son. Father, I pray uh, for those that maybe don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today you would work in their hearts, that they would choose to let down the weights of their sin and to follow you. Father, I also pray for those that that know you and that follow you. Father, I, I pray that uh, you would help us and strengthen us uh, to, to follow your words and to live within the boundaries that you've placed. Father, that we would uh, be Christians that would glorify you in everything we do and everything we say, that we would let down this weight of our sin and follow you. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.